let's move our discussion of hedging to stock index futures. And these are a little bit different because they are cash settled. So there is no delivery of the underlying asset. They're cash settled. Now, what makes them particularly interesting to look at is the index itself is a hypothetical portfolio. It's not a real portfolio. So far, we've been looking at situations in which we have exposure to a real asset and we use a futures contract to hedge out that risk. But a stock index, and especially the stock index future, the future is on an index, which is a hypothetical portfolio. So it's sort of a little bit different. So let's have a look. We have cash settled. It is still marked to market, which means there's daily settlement. And our last day settlement, the price of the futures contract will equal the price of the index, either at market open or at market close on the last day. There are two types of indices. This should be review, by the way. There are two types of indices. There's price-weighted indices. That would be the Dow. And there's a market cap-weighted index, which is the S&P 500. Uh, most um, professionals in the industry uh, will uh, uh, side with this statement that the market cap-weighted index is the more relevant index to watch. As such, if you look at the futures on the Dow versus the futures on the S&P 500, very little even gets traded on the Dow anymore. It's almost insignificant. I, I, I can tell you almost uh, hour by hour where the S&P is, but where the Dow is, I don't care. Uh, most people really don't care. It's not quoted that much in professional circles. With the market cap weighted index, there are futures contracts on it. There's the ES, which is the mini uh, S&P 500 contract, which is for 50 times the index by far the most liquid, the most volume and the most liquid by far, not by a, a small margin, by a huge margin. And then you have the full contract, which is the SPX. Uh, this is for 250 times the index. So let's see how we use an index, a future on an index, which is, again, I reiterate, a hypothetical portfolio. There is no real asset underlying this futures contract. It's a hypothetical portfolio that's cash settled. So let's see if that changes anything. One note off the top. This, this the hedging that we're going to talk about only works for a well-diversified portfolio. If you're holding uh, several hundred thousand dollars in stocks mixed, uh, spread out over four or five stocks, mostly concentrated in... Uh, one or two particular sectors. That's not a well-diversified portfolio. Uh, this sort of hedging strategy that we're getting into probably isn't going to work very well. You'd have to look for something else. So this is only for a well-diversified portfolio. So a couple of variables. V sub A is the value, the current value of the portfolio that you actually hold. Not, not the index, not a hypothetical portfolio, but it's an actual portfolio that you now have exposure to. Whether it's an all-long portfolio or an all-short portfolio, you have exposure to that. VF is the current value of one futures contract. So if you're using the ES, it's wherever the futures price is times 50. And if you're using the SPX, it's whatever the futures uh, contract price is at times 250. So if we're looking for the optimal number of contracts to hedge out a portfolio, if we put the value of our portfolio in the numerator and the value of one contract in the denominator, we should get the number of contracts we need so that the value of all the futures contracts equals the value of our portfolio only if the beta of the portfolio equals one. Only if. Because this, the value of the futures contract, that's the hypothetical portfolio, that's the index, that's the market, that has a beta of one. So if our portfolio does not have a beta of one, this will not work. So how do we find beta? Well, uh, we can use the capital asset pricing model to find it, in which case what we're looking at is the return on the portfolio minus the risk-free rate, the excess return on the portfolio minus the risk-free rate, versus the excess return on the index less the rest uh, over the risk free rate and we might get a relationship depending on on the type of stocks that we have whether we have a lot of uh, defensive stocks or a lot of cyclical stocks we'll get a measure of beta from y equals alpha plus 
beta x plus some error term. There's our measure of beta for the market. Uh, or sorry, the measure of beta for our portfolio versus the market itself. So beta, if beta is 1, we're holding a portfolio that basically resembles the market. This is a valid uh, um, calculation for the optimal number of contracts. But if beta is less than 1 or greater than 1, then we have to modify our calculation for the optimal number of contracts. And it is very close to what we've already seen for the optimal number of contracts when we're cross-hedging. Remember, if we're cross-hedging, it's H star multiplied by the value of our position divided by the value of the contract. This is simply beta times the value of A over the value of the futures contract. So we're multiplying whatever we get we're multiplying it by beta. So if beta equals 1, then the beta just disappears, and, it, and this simply becomes this formula. If beta is greater than 1, obviously we'll need more contracts. If beta is less than 1, we'll need less. To see how we would implement a, a hedge on a portfolio, uh, it's worth following the example given in Chapter 3. Uh, so that's what we're going to do here. So I've drawn out a timeline. And what we have is uh, um, broken down into quarters, or, or sorry, months, uh, from t equals 0 to t equals 4 months. We're going to use a contract that expires in 4 months to hedge out 3 months of risk. Uh, so there's going to be a mismatch between the end of the hedge and the expiration of the uh, futures contract itself. So at the t equals 0, at this particular point in time, before we initiate anything, the index is at 1,000. That's the spot on the index, since it closed at 1,000, let's say, uh, today. Uh, SPX, uh, which is the futures contract, is 1010. And the SPX contract is for an expiration date down here. So it currently has a uh, price of 1010 as of today, but it has an expiration date four months out. The value of the portfolio we want to hedge out is 5050000 This portfolio has a beta of 1.5. The risk-free rate is 4% per annum. Since we're hedging out for three months, the risk-free rate over this period of time is really 1% because if it's 4% per annum, it's 1% per quarter. And there's a dividend yield of 1% per annum, so our dividend over that period of time will give us a cash inflow of 0.25 percent. So we want to hedge out any price risk. The question is, what do we do? How many contracts do we need? Well, here's our optimal number of contracts up here, uh, as we recall. We know our beta is 1.5. We know the value of the portfolio and the value of the futures contract. So we can fill it in, 1.5. And the value of our portfolio, as we are told, is 5 million. 50,000 and the value of one futures contract we're using SPX which is 250 times the index which is 1010 at this particular point so if we multiply uh, that out we will get 30 contracts well does that make sense that's a, that's the answer but let's just see if that makes sense let's see what happens in, in a certain situation so Let's say that at three months, the index in three months' time falls from 1,000 to 900. And let's say that the SPX, it still has one month to go, mind you, but let's say that the SPX goes from 1010 to 902. How does that look? Well, number one, let's calculate our gain on the futures. Gain on futures. So we are short the futures contract. We were th short 30 of them. And we're short 30 of them for how many points? Well, 1010 down to 902. So we actually did pretty good here. Now, each point is worth $250 to us. So if we multiply that out, we made $810,000 over the three month period on the futures contract. So there's our gain. What's not so easy to figure out is the loss that we suffered on our portfolio. That's a two-step process. Number one, or let's say step two, but number one in figuring out the portfolio loss, is what is our loss on the index? Let's start there. Well, the index started at 1,000, went to 900, 
And if we divide that by the original 1,000, we find that we had a drop of 10% on the index, plus our dividend yield. Remember, we have cash inflow of 0.25. Most people just forget about that. That's where the problem lies. Yes, the index dropped 10%, but, we, but a holder wouldn't suffer 10%. If they held a portfolio that mirrored the index, they would have realized 0.25 gain on the dividend, so the actual loss is negative 9.75% for a portfolio with a beta of 1. But we don't have a beta of 1, do we? So now that we have the percentage loss on the index, we can now calculate the loss on the portfolio. And before we do this, let's just remember uh, how we calculate that. Remember now, our expected return using CAPM, the capital asset pricing model, will be the risk-free rate plus the beta of our portfolio times the difference between the excess return of the portfolio, which is the market return, minus the risk-free rate. So if we have a beta of 1, we have the market. And that's from CAPM. And how do we get uh, beta is eventually arrived at um, through estimates. We use estimates uh, from historical returns. So we have to keep that in mind. These estimates are from historical returns. So the future may not look like the past. It may, may not. So what's our loss on the portfolio? Well, here is our, here's our guide. So our estimate, our expected return on the portfolio will be the risk-free rate plus our beta, the return uh, on the uh, um, on the market, which is here, we already calculated that negative 9.75 minus the risk-free rate. Since we're negative, our loss is even greater, right? So if we uh, do all the math on this, we'll get negative 15.125%. So let me just reiterate that again, what we've done here, because this is a two-step process. And it can be confusing sometimes. It's easy enough to follow along, but when given a blank problem saying, go ahead, uh, the calculation of, like, of the gain on the futures is rather straightforward. But when we get to loss on the index, the two steps sometimes get conflated into one, and then there's confusion. Number one, we need to know the loss on the index. Never mind our portfolio. Never mind that for now. Just what did the index lose as a percentage? If our portfolio has a beta of 1, we're okay. If it doesn't have a beta of 1, this is our starting point. So it lost 10%. Adjusted for the dividend, we're down 9.75. So using the capital asset pricing model, which is the risk-free rate plus beta times the excess return over the risk-free rate, we would do the same thing here. 1 plus, our risk-free rate is 1, remember, for the three months here plus 1.5 is our beta. Let's get that little decimal place in there so we see it. Multiplied by the return on the market, which we've already calculated. We need that first, which is why we did this first. Negative 9.75 minus the risk-free rate of 1 gives us negative 15.125. So while the market suffered a loss of 9.75% over that three months, our portfolio, because it has a higher beta, lost 15.125%. What does that mean? Well, let's calculate the value of our portfolio, which will be 5,050,000 times 1 minus 0.15125. If it lost 15%, we must have 85% left over, right? Which equals 4,286,187. So, we have a gain on the futures of 810,000 and the value of our portfolio now is 4.2 million so if we add our 810 gain that we uh, achieved we have 5 million 96 1 8 7 so we hedged out the risk but not only did we hedge out the risk we actually did better and if we figure out how much better we did we did better by about 1%. Does that make a lot of sense? Yes, it does. Because keep in mind that our beta has been measured by the excess return over the risk-free rate. 
It's not the return from zero. It's not a beta that's calculated from, from assuming zero and up as our expected return, but our excess return over the risk-free rate. So since our beta is a function of the excess return over the risk-free rate, if we hedge that out, all we should be left with is the risk-free rate. The risk-free rate was 1% over that period of time. This is roughly about 1% higher than when we started because we hedged out everything else except the risk-free rate. There's a nice example.